So for the next panel, uh, the next panel is going to be called Luxury Brands. It will be moderated by Cyril Camus, chairman of Camus Cognac. In the panel, we will have Count Charles von Faber-Castell, managing director of Faber-Castell Premium, Asunta Jimenez Ontiveros, PR and communications director of Chanel, Spain and Portugal, Pierre Lacharlotte, general manager of Montre Jouren America. We will welcome back Laila Hanna, CEO of Hamasource. Please welcome back this panel. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have a very exciting panel of, um, of speakers here, uh, spanning uh, many different facets of the luxury industry and across many different horizons of time. Uh, you have in um, front of you um, people who are running luxury businesses and luxury brands, uh, some of them founded by themselves, uh, some of them founded uh, by others. Um, Laila, we uh, have heard uh, already uh, earlier uh, today, has uh, developed a brand of luxury cosmetics, Luxme, uh, very recently, and, and is now expanding the distribution of those products, um, both regionally and internationally. Um, Pierre, uh, from um, FP Journ, um, is uh, running a company um, that uh, was created slightly more than 20 years ago and is already uh, globally uh, available. Um, those two companies, uh, as we'll see, uh, have uh, different reasons of being than, than the other two uh, members of this panel. Uh, we have with us uh, Asunta from Chanel. Um, Chanel was created slightly over 100 years ago by Gabrielle Chanel, also called Coco Chanel, who was probably the first and most successful international woman entrepreneur. So I think this is very relevant today that we, we would have here at, uh, at Babson Connect uh, someone repre representing this company that was started uh, by a woman entrepreneur at a time when this was not uh, very, very common at all. And then we have also joining us uh, Charles von Fomba Castell, Faber-Castell is a company, family-owned company with over 250 years of history. To put that in perspective, the US as a nation did not exist when Faber-Castell was uh, created. Uh, Faber-Castell is also, it is also thanks to Lothar von Faber-Castell that the notion of protection of intellectual property exists. Uh, they were the first uh, company to, um, to request that uh, things that were created by people could actually be protected and, uh, and then create, uh, thanks to them, actually, we are now able to create all the value that has been created in the luxury uh, business. So we, we have people who have been fundamental in, in creating um, the luxury world. Um, to start with, um, companies such as, uh, as Chanel, most luxury brands, uh, including my, my own, were created by, by people who use their, their skill set or, or uh, knowledge to basically make a living for themselves, provide for, for their families, and, and develop a business that way. But as we've seen this morning, some, some companies are started for an entirely different um, purpose, and we, we've heard from Lila earlier on. Um, and I would like to ask you, Pierre, I think FP Journ uh, was created also for a very unique type of purpose. If you could maybe explain to us uh, how it came to be. Yes, uh, I'm pretty sure no one here in this room, except very few, will know about this brand. It's a very, very, very tiny brand that was created about 20 years ago. But Mr. Journe is considered to be already the best watchmaker alive. Not necessarily the best company. But, and actually, there's a case study at Babson about Mr. Journe and his vision of why create a company. And it is not about money. That's not his goal. He could not care less about money. To this day, he doesn't own an apartment. He doesn't own a car. He owns the equity of the, in, the, in the factory, in the manufacturer that we have. So money is extremely important for the goal, the essence, the, the aim of the company, which is to make the best watches ever in the history of, of uh, uh, horological uh, history. And that's it. So the whole business plan is, is changes. We don't care about growth. For us, it's not to be the biggest. It is to be the best. And that changes the whole paradigm of the, um, 
of the launch of the company. And um, Charles, your company is, is, quite, an, is quite an old um, a company, but in many ways it is today entirely different from, from what it, uh, it has been in the past. In fact, you and, and your father had to totally reinvent uh, the company in the past 35 years. Can you take us through why you did this and, and how you actually managed to do this? Well, first off, let me say it was my father, actually, in the past uh, 40 years. Uh, I've been in the business for the past uh, four years. Unfortunately, he passed away two years ago. Um, but with a business like ours, it's very important to think long term. And you know, my father faced a number of challenges when he took over the business. Some of you may be familiar with slide rules. That was even before my time. But we were one of the leading suppliers of slide rules in the 60s, 70s until an innovative company from Plano, Texas invented the pocket calculator, which overnight killed that business. So we were faced with a crisis. We'd lost 30, 40% of our revenues. We managed to stay afloat. And then going into the 80s, my father was faced with similar challenges, maybe not of that magnitude, but also of developing a strategy for the future of Faber-Castell. And at the time, he was there was a big trend towards computer-aided design. Our product assortment was primarily based around technical drawing and, and solely artist products. So he had to think whether he would follow and go into this technology or stick to the roots of Faber-Castell or also sort of rediscover what the roots of Faber-Castell were. And he looked to previous generations. My father was the eighth generation, by the way. We are the ninth generation now. So. What, what he did is he also looked to what the previous generations had done and how they had established the business 100, 150 years ago and what the, what the key products were. So it was, a, it was a reconnecting strategy, if you will. And he built the business uh, around five product categories. It was children's pr products, playing and learning, educational creativity products, artist products, general day-to-day -day office products, marking, and then premium products, so um, fountain pens and, and products from 20 euros upwards, and then creating the brand of Graf and Faber-Castell. And his, his goal was also to create Faber-Castell as a global premium brand, which he successfully did. So in, in many respects, he, what he did is he looked back to the past, studied the past very intensively, and then looked forward and, and built his strategy on that. And so today, Faber Castell went from being the, the perfect, making the perfect pencil, to also doing so uh, desk accessories, uh, premium pens, and writing instruments, and exactly. And so, goods, yeah. when speaking of of Graf and Faber Castell, that was sort of his his uh, brainchild in the early '90s. Was based around a, uh, making the most luxurious pencil that sold for at the time it was 400 Deutschmark. And a lot of people told him he was crazy, and nobody was going to buy this product. And it turned out to be a, a real success, so it opened the door uh, to fountain pens, desk accessories, and leather goods, which we've managed to est establish ourselves uh, quite well in the past few years. And did you create a special collection with Karl Lagerfeld, no, too? We did. Actually, there was a, we did a limited edition uh, two years ago, uh, the so-called K-Box. It was 2,500 pieces for 2,500 euros. Um, and it was, a, it was an interesting collaboration because we, we don't do a lot of uh, collaborations with other brands. Uh, but my father had known Karl Lagerfeld for a number of years. He did uh, the wedding dress of, of my stepmother. And so he had a good relationship, and it was sort of a mutual respect. And out of that came this, this product idea. Uh, which was a big su success, particularly also to the social media buzz it, it created. So it gave a very good resonance for, for our brand. Uh -huh. okay. uh, actually, um, you mentioned social media and Asunta when we were talking about all the evolutions of, of Chanel over time and what your key challenges over the past few years um, have been and will be going forward. Um, you mentioned the emergence of, of social media and how that changed the way you, you're communicating with your clientele around the world. Um, can you maybe go into this? Yes. Uh, I have been working for uh, 15 years for Chanel, and everything has changed, especially the communication. No? 
when I began to, to work in Chanel, it was easy because you have only what, the same products, the same channels this, uh, through, especially the, the print is, you know, El Vogue magazine. And now uh, the panorama is absolutely uh, fragment, the fragmentation no, of the media uh, sector. Now, to sell a lipstick, only a lipstick, you have to invest in traditional media, print, but also in, on webs, create a special event, an experience in the both of sales, and to select and manage the best uh, ambassador, celebrities, so key opinion leader, influencers, to, to trans translate the message. So it's very important, especially for to reach the, millenn the millennial. But I personally think millennial is not a question of age, it's a question of attitude, because now everybody uses uh, uh, digital uh, assets and, and, and tools. No? And, and we have to, to, to work, obviously, to be more disruptive, more creative, uh, and uh, to find and to the, the perfect balance between earn, paid, media, uh, because uh, now uh, we produce a lot of content. No? Uh, you, you obviously need uh, media, but your own media uh, have to be uh, connected with the paid uh, and earned media. No? And, and for example, in Chanel, we have a special service for celebrities. No? It's, it's so important to reach the new generation, to, to, to have the, the right ambassadors and this link of international and national uh, influencers to, 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 to reach uh, the people. Laila, in, in many ways, you are your own brand ambassador as the founder of, um, of Luxme and, and a very public uh, person as well. You, you are uh, representing that, that brand and the, the purpose behind the brand. You also have a very unusual uh, way of getting into the luxury industry because you come from technology. Um, how did you bridge this or what did you bring from technology world into, into luxury? How has that been useful to you? Yeah, and, and there's really two bridges. There's both the technology side and social impact. And most people don't think of social impact when they think of luxury. And yet, luxury brands understand one key aspect of sustainability that at least is foreign in Silicon Valley, which is long-termism. Our obsession with short-termism is at the root of a lot of the challenges to sustainability in fashion. And uh, most people don't know this, but fashion is actually the second most environmentally degrading industry after energy. And it's not really luxury fashion, it's fast fashion that's the driver of that. It's this obsession with making cheap stuff and throwing it away at the end of every cycle as opposed to making something that's high quality and beautiful that the customer has throughout her lifetime. So I actually think there's a lot of opportunity for, um, for those two worlds to be more bridged. Um, so we integrate uh, sustainability in the supply chain of Luxme by sourcing uh, our main ingredients from fair trade cooperatives. And we want to bring an awareness that beautiful things, things that make us look more beautiful, should not just resonate with beauty at the end point in terms of how they look on the retail shelf, but should resonate with beauty in terms of how they're made. Every aspect of how an ingredient is sourced, uh, to how it's treated in the factory, to how people are paid when they're making it, goes into the final uh, production. And, uh, and luxury gets this. I, I had the chance to attend an Hermes um, event earlier this year and learned about the craftsmanship behind the brand. And I was really amazed by this concept of artisanal production, which um, I think is being in some ways lost in, a, in an automated world. Um, however, technology has a, a lot of roles to play uh, in the luxury industry, and what we've seen at, at Luxme is two big trends. One is the shift towards uh, direct-to-consumer purchasing models, so rather than the traditional retail model, building a relationship as a brand directly with a customer throughout the entire purchasing process. So from recruiting that customer uh, through a Facebook ad or ideally through a piece of earned media, all the way through, uh, we have a Facebook Messenger bot that follows up with the customer once they've purchased the product to remind them to repurchase and also to share interesting content around the brand. And one of the advantages you have as a sustainable brand is a lot of really powerful stories to tell that I believe make the brand more sticky. 
And in our case, we, we actually uh, have video recordings of the women who harvest the raw nuts. It's, uh, we harvest an ingredient called nilotica. It's a, it's a rare varietal of shea butter. Um, and I liken it to fine wine. You know, all red wine is made from red grapes. But there are obviously very different kinds of red grapes that yield different qualities of wine. So we like to tell the whole terroir story of this rare nut and tell it through the lens of the women who are harvesting it. And imagine how cool it is if you buy one of our products and then you get a messenger reminder on Facebook that says, hey, you know, meet Sarah Amolo. She's the head of the cooperative that harvests these nuts. By the way, your purchase is helping Sarah's family go to school. Um, and here's her talking about the beautiful region where this grows. And that, to me, builds a much stronger relationship with the customer than just having a salesperson in a retail store you know, translate the message. Um, and there are many, many ways that we can use technology to improve transparency. We actually. Um, in our initial launch at Sephora, we put a, a harvest number on every sticker uh, or on a sticker on every product that we sold. And if you go to our website and you look up the harvest number, you can meet the women who harvested the nuts that are in that jar of skincare. And this is only possible now you know, through technology. And I, I meet winemakers and chocolate makers and coffee um, producers who have similar models that promote transparency. And customers love that. I mean, there's no better way to engage with a brand. They, they, they do, but they, this is very interesting. So you're using social media as well as uh, retailers and, and bringing their experience at retail level. And my understanding is that for both Faber-Castell and, and Chanel, the, the evolution also of the distribution model has been, has been a major um, challenge. And, and how do we actually maintain that dialogue and, and the consumer experience at, at, at the retail level? How, how do you relate to, to what we just heard? So, I mean, I, I think if you look at the changes in retail, I think we can all agree that it's not been an evolution, it's been a revolution in the past five to 10 years. You know, alone Amazon and, and, and many other online platforms, whether it's Mr. Porter, you know, the list goes on. So people are buying differently. We notice it in our business too that, you know, there's, there's, there's challenges with the traditional retail that we have. For the most part, it's department stores and specialty retail. So the department stores are under cost pressure, obviously, and uh, the specialty retail stores are, are dying away. So, and you have this huge shift to online. Uh, despite that, I think it's important to con still consider how do you present the brand, and the, the idea of communicating the aspects of the brand. I think in the past, it was really just about the product itself, and now it's more about the experience and the brand. So the physical retail has taken a different role, and I think it's important to consider that. It's not just about um, the sales per square foot anymore. It's about experience. What can you tell? What story can you tell on the physical retail? And uh, particularly in China, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible, the, the development of, of online retail. I think China is, a, is ahead of us in that regard. Um, you know, it's astounding if you think, to put it in perspective, that online retail is roughly uh, $2 trillion worldwide. Half of that is done in, in China. Um, two years ago, it was 40%. Now they do 50%. By 2020, it's going to be 60%. So the Chinese online e-commerce market is going to grow by 200 billion in the next two years, so, which presents significant opportunities, but also challenges. Uh, from Chanel, Chanel has very clear has, has her policy, because Chanel works in three different uh, business, uh, fashion, in beauty, and watches and jewelry. In perfumes, uh, we, we, we work uh, through e-commerce, of course, and uh, retail and, and different. But for fashion, no. It's not the, vo the volunteer of, of the company. Because honestly, the service, the experience, the, the, the relationship to fidelize the clients is unique in, the, in our own boutiques. It's uh, something special not to connect your clients. So for the moment, uh, in fashion, you only can buy for the moment. Embodic. For the moment. Yeah. For the moment. Yeah. But I think uh, Chanel has his own uh, figures, no? Because uh, at the end, uh, connecting with the, that you are speaking, we, we have to, 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 to tell stories, no? to, to, to seduce uh, people, no? uh, because yeah. this is uh, the values that differentiate our brands. No? Uh, be coherent with your image, uh, loyal uh, yourself, uh, and uh, has the space and the time to explain 
what are your values, the, 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 the atelier, the savoir-faire, the, why uh, to educate the new generation to realize what is a luxury product, you know, because you have a lot of things behind this. You know, it's, it's not an only a brand, it's a, a lot of metiers, uh, working, uh, image, values, you know, it's very important. But also, I think, you know, I think um, luxury consumers, you know, in the past have been criticized for conspicuous consumption, and this is where I think there's such an opportunity to bridge this gap. The people who are at the base of our supply chain at Luxme are the very people who would benefit from partners in health programs, <laughs> you know, in Africa. They are coming from very poor backgrounds. We can use these business models and luxury to elevate people like that, to deliberately go out and hire low-income people in regions like northern Uganda, pay them living wages, and promote a concept of shared prosperity. And to me, if you're paying a lot for a handbag or you're paying a lot for a jar of skin cream, it should darn well be making the world better as part of that purchase. And so often we think that that has to be relegated to philanthropy, but we can actually include that in our business models. I was on a panel um, a while ago in Davos with a, with a woman at Chanel who was telling me about a project, I don't know if I'm, okay, I'm just gonna say it here because I think it's good for your brand, but she was telling me about a project where uh, Chanel was looking at uh, doing artisanal training programs for low-income and marginalized women in France mm -hmm. to teach them to work in the atelier. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a really powerful story. If I buy a bag, I want that bag to have meaning and purpose, not just mm -hmm. to have the Chanel logo yes. and to look pretty. And I, I really think that's something that the modern consumer demands and something that luxury brands can integrate with their philosophies. I think that, that actually goes at the core of, of, of luxury and what you, you're saying is, uh, is fundamentally one, one great way for luxury to, to have more of a social impact. Our businesses, and, unless I'm wrong, but please expand on that, are, are based on craftsmanship and it's all people. Yes. I mean, there are two things that matter in, in the luxury business. It is, it is our consumers, but it is, it is the workers that are making those beautiful uh, crafted products and, and actually focusing our attention not just on the scale of the product, but where the people are coming from uh, who are working in the, uh, in the workshops would be, would be maybe something interesting. Do, do you, I know you're a very socially uh, conscious company. Have, have you done any experiments in, in that direction? Well, you know, our, our company, and, and it goes to the long-term thinking, so this long-termism that, that you mentioned before, um, you know, when, when my father uh, was in this, phase of re-strategizing re the business in the 80s. He was also thinking about the supply, and he secured a number of plantations in, in South America where we replant our own wood, not only to secure our supply, but also uh, we also, through that, have uh, achieved a carbon neutrality, which is very rare for a comp company of our size. And this is something we really haven't talked about much. And uh, I think we're, we're very German in that sense. We're focused on the product, on quality. But these are, are things that are more and more interesting to consumers all over the world. So uh, we're, we're talking about those things. But I think we're, it, as a German company, we're very honest about that. We want to make sure that we, we say the right story and don't use it too much as sort of a marketing campaign. For, for you, Pierre, also craftsmanship is, is uh, actually has more an impact than I think any are, of, of, the, of the companies here represented because this is the main limit to, to how many products you can actually release into the world and then that in turn drives your, your distribution system and aspirations. Is that correct? Right, because you know, the, the idea of, like last year we produced, and we were very transparent about this, we produced 659 mechanical watches and we insist on the nine because we count one by one. Uh, but it's because it's a matter of the complexity of the watch and the amount of watchmaker or man hours you can have. Very much like, you know, uh, Hermes de Birkin or the Kelly bag, they could outsource, you know, elsewhere, but they don't. And they're trying to keep everything in-house. And the Chanel invested a lot of money uh, in the past 10 years to acquire whatever craftsmen they could not control. Chanel likes to have a vertical integration also we are, at our level, also vertically integrated. We make our own components, cases, you know, and, and uh, dials. We even, in the future, and it's already planned, to have a school uh, on top of our building in the middle of Geneva where it's going to be uh, kind of like the PhD of watchmaking, like the master watchmaker. After you go to school, then you go there. And then you'll be uh, capable, as a watchmaker, to make your own components. Because that's the problem in a watch. You're missing one screw, 
you can't deliver it. And you know, in, in very simple watches, you have already 200, 300 components, and up and up and up. So craftsmanship and the protection of it, and the lack of, you know, if you look at France, for example, who was, you know, one with Italy, one of the epitome of luxury and craftsmanship. In France, we lost most of it. Italy is one of the last frontier where you really have, you know, uh, still a lot of craftsmen, which could be repairing a violin from like the uh, 18th century. Who's going to do this in France? No one. So it's it's a very small company. It's going to be a very small job, but it's it's protecting, you know, the future, because if you lose, you know, the past and craftsmen are, are a testimony of the past, then there's no future. And building a future without knowing your past is extremely complicated. You know, Chanel created uh, 15 years ago Paraffection. It's a company uh, who buy this uh, uh, atelier uh, to maintain the savoir-faire for all the fashion industry. I'm speaking of uh, Broderie Le Sage, Le Marier, 11 different uh, ateliers in order to maintain, you know, because as you say, uh, this, this kind of, of works for young people uh, don't, uh, don't want to work in this kind of um, handmade things, no? And it's essential to, to maintain the difference and the quality. Yeah, I think we, luxury, we, we might have been really good at selling our products to consumers, but not only selling the, uh, also the, the, the interest of working in our, in our companies, although we, we see it because when you work through, through the manufacturing plants, the workshops, you see the, 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 the pride that comes from, from creating beautiful objects and, and, and also being linked to, to, to heritage and, and, um, and to, to beautifully executed movements of, of every sort. And, and that is something I think you mentioned in our phone call. It, um, it enables people, it, it, there's, an, there's a nobility in doing a beautiful a beautiful thing, and, and this we see that in our companies every day. But I'm not sure we've been really good on LinkedIn expressing this uh, uh, so much. Maybe, but probably if you look at the semantic root, artisan, artist, it's the same thing. Mm. There's art in there, and then either you protect it. I mean, is art necessary? No, but do we, can't we live without it? Probably no either. So, so it's whoever we are. And so it's not that as important as saving the world. I agree, watchmaking is already a dinosaur uh, uh, industry because of the iPhone. But this is not what you're doing. You're not telling time. You're looking at the craftsmanship that's behind and the high ticks. And believe me, for a watchmaker, for the first watch, when the first creation, when it ticks, it is a pleasure. It is like a life uh, uh, changing uh, proposition spoken like a true Frenchman. I have to say, so I, my other company is in artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? And so the great irony is that Sama is basically creating training data to automate processes, including processes in factories like producing goods. Interestingly, I think we are going to see a premium paid for human-made items in the future. And everyone always asks me, are you worried about automation? I actually think that um, if you can afford to buy something that's made by a qualified craftsman who puts love and attention to detail and beauty and art into a physical product, I think there will always be a premium for that. And in fact, I think that premium will grow as, uh, as things are mechanized. And so I think, interestingly, the um, artisanal production and the luxury world is where we might see job growth in the future as machines automate more of the you know, lower end goods and services. I think it is, yes, both a vastly underestimated source of, uh, of employment and, and it is not very visible, but luxury is growing and it is, it, it is less conspicuous consumption and, and throwing money at the, at the wrong things. It, it is actually creating uh, a lot of value throughout the, um, throughout the social chain more and more and, and preserving heritage, as, um, as you mentioned, which I believe is incredibly um, important. Um, as we are here in, in an educational institution, um, should we teach luxury in business schools? Absolutely. <laughs> yes, 100%. <coughs> Absolutely. Because it's, it's a cultural per, uh, idea. It's also you need to have the whole context of it, whether it's uh, making cognac. I don't know if you know how to make cognac. As Cyril Lafleur, it's not that easy. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, everybody would do it. Uh, but because you're protecting the past. So you have to do this. You have to educate uh, uh, students and at least be aware of what's happening. And again, maybe not necessarily to make a lot of money. Maybe that's not you know, their calling. 
thank God, it's other people that are doing things that are not just for money and nothing wrong with, with making money. But I think it's important to have at least the vision of like what's available for me as a student. Okay. Well, at this stage, I think I would like to thank our panel for sharing their, their, their stories and uh, thank you.